Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I want to talk to you today about digital audio filtering, picking up on the audio filtering discussion we had previously. Welcome. I hope things are doing well, and I will uh, just go ahead and dive into this topic because we have a lot to talk about. So, the idea of sort of all modern audio processing is to do the least you reasonably can get away with in the electronics, in the mechanics. What we'd like to do is to go as tightly as possible from sound pressure to samples at the Nyquist, you know, with frequencies up near the Nyquist limit. So the idea here is if I'm bringing sound in from my microphone, I'd like to end up, and sampling at 48 kilohertz, I'd like to end up with nice clean 48 kilohertz samples that can capture sounds up to 24 kilohertz. When I'm going the other way and playing to the speaker, I'd like to stuff my 48 kilohertz samples out and get sound at frequencies up to 48 kilohertz or of 24 kilohertz out of that sample. So that's the idea. And there's some analog filtering that's necessary. We discussed a little of that last time. But beyond that, what I really want to do is do as much of the filtering as possible in software or maybe in digital hardware. Maybe I have some logic that actually does the filtering. And that will ensure for us that we do a good job because we can build much better filters, it turns out, digitally, where better here is some objective measure. Now, the electronics people will quibble with this. They'll say, well, you know, the smoothness of an analog filter is way better. There's no, not so many weird artifacts and blah, blah. But it just turns out per unit of effort, per unit of cost, we can build very fancy software filters relative to what we can build digitally. And so even the double E's mostly use a lot of digital filtering these days. So there's a topic that we need to talk about in detail, which is sort of an aside, but it's an aside that's going to matter for what we're going to do, and that's how do we represent numbers in these systems. And we've talked about that before. It's been a thing we've talked about earlier in this series of lectures. But it really starts to matter when we talk about filtering because filtering does a lot of processing on each sample, and so mistakes that you make in your choice of sample representation are really going to haunt you more than they would in a lot of other kinds of processing. Uh, we can pick integers at the sampling resolution. We've talked about that before. Now, the most common audio sampling sizes are sort of 12 to 16 bits, and 24 bits and at 12 to 16 bits you could conceivably use the 16 bit integers to represent your samples the problem with that is that you don't have much overhead if i add two 16 bit numbers the result is in general going to be a 17 bit number which won't fit anymore and so I'm going to have precision issues, which are going to start to drive me nuts. And so generally, we want to have some extra bits to make it easier to process the audio if we're going to work internally in a representation like that. With 24-bit, you obviously want to promote to at least 32 bits. On a modern desktop, none of this is an issue. An obvious thing to do if you want to work with integers is to just promote everything to 64-bit ints and have big fun with it. But of course, if you're on an 8-bit microcontroller, 64-bit processing is maybe a little expensive. Um, and then, of course, you have to decide, well, how many bits do I have left of precision? What do I have to do to output samples that fairly represent the sound I want, given that I've done a bunch of processing, introduced noise, etc.? So why would I want to work with integer samples when floating point samples are so nice? Well, speed. Uh, even on modern microprocessing desktops, the integer multiplier is just going to be way faster than the floating point multiplier overall. And those kind of speed differences can make a big difference when you're uh, trying to do things exceptionally quickly. Now, on an 8-bit microcontroller or a 16-bit microcontroller like the AVR, you know, really 
integer is your only choice anyway, and so you probably will be working in integers. And the question is just how much precision you want to work with. Like I've said before, mostly in this course I'd work in floating point. I usually scale it to minus one to one. That's kind of an industry convention, but zero to one is a thing people do sometimes. Uh, use 32 or 64 bit floating point. Um, so you have not only to choose floating point, now you gotta choose a floating point size. And this is better than when I was a boy. When I was a boy, there were, t there were 15 sizes, depending on whose computer you were working with that had floating point. And you know there was a lot of floating point formats out there, and the end result of all that was this IEEE floating point standard. And now there's, in most machines, your choice of 32-bit floats or 64-bit doubles, as C calls them. And 32-bit looks convenient. It has 24 bits of mantissa of precision of significant depending on what you want to call it on a particular day and it's probably good enough for most of the audio things you'd want to do but realistically the difference between that and doubles for most of what you want to do on a modern real machine not that big a performance difference and I would probably just choose the doubles just so that you make sure you preserve all the bits you can. When you're dealing with filtering in particular it's really common to have very large differences between values in the system and this is why floating point is so attractive but it's also why having more exponent bits is really super nice and having enough mantissa bits so you don't lose precision when you add these different values. Um, on even little microcontrollers these days, the the um, STM F F series series arms, some of them have a uh, floating point, and so an awful lot of the time this is a choice. If you don't have hard floating point, well, maybe you can use software floating point. The on a 32-bit ARM processor or a 32-bit RISC-V processor, really it's not that many instructions to compute a floating point value even if you don't have a floating point processor. And so you might just choose to compile for soft floating point and go on. If you're on a 16-bit AVR or an 8-bit B or something like that, probably not so much. Probably you're going to be stuck with integer formats. Uh, with the floating point format, the reason we want it is because these issues of precision and resolution mostly go away, but be careful because IEEE floats are full of weird corners. There's int values representing infinities and NAND values representing not a number. And in audio, those are almost never a feature. Almost always, if you have ints or NANDs creep into your system from some computation, you'll wish the whole thing and just crash. So you really got to watch out for that and make sure you're not going to hit those in your code and that's hard to do. A third number representation that we haven't talked about so much but it's a thing people have used and still occasionally do use is what's called a fixed point representation. And by fixed point what we mean is that we treat our binary number as a fraction with a decimal point in some fixed location that we sort of fiat it, it is at and we do all the computations as if they were fractional computations with that decimal point so if you take the 16-bit number that looks like this there's sort of an implicit de if you put a sort of implicit decimal point right here well this is a positive number because the sign bit is zero and this is worth one half one fourth one eighth one sixteenth and so forth and if you add all those up you end up with a number that looks about like this. This is uh, the decimal representation, more or less, of that number. If you look at this one with this one on, well, this, we think of this as a sine bit, and so there's two ways to think about it. If you think of this as sine magnitude, then this is the sine, these bits are the fractional magnitude, and you get a decimal representation like this in sine magnitude. Uh, if you think of this as two's complement, then I complement this, but I also complement all these zeros and ones, and I end up with a representation that looks more like this. And so that would be sort of the two's complement value of that number. And um, why? Why would you ever want to use two's complement in this situation? Well, you'd want to use two's complement because what you really want to do is use the ordinary integer 
add unit to do the arithmetic, you know, integer or ALU to do the arithmetic. And so if you're going to do that, then you really want to use whatever format the ALU is using. The trick then is that sometimes you have to adjust the decimal point at the end. So, for example, if I in, add, uh, and I have to worry about clamping and that kind of stuff, there's some tricks to this, but it's a thing I can make work, and it's sort of a compromise between floating point and fixed point. Sorry, floating point and integer. It's very much more like integer than like floating point. I don't get any nice scaling properties, but it does mean that I can be less careful about pr some precision issues and it is very fast um, on a lot of machines. Here's another example with the with the with eight bits of integer part and eight bits of floating part and so if you, since this is a negative number again it's two's complement so this is minus 105.996 something in two's complement um, and that implicit decimal point there again it can be really super helpful if I'm you if I'm working with 16-bit samples for example in a 32-bit register that 16.32 format you know 16.16 format that's 32 bits may be a way to go now the problem with this is that it's as fiddly as you'd expect it to be especially for languages that don't allow you to implement a fixed point type with normal arithmetic so if you're gonna have to hand it hand roll this then it can get ugly if you're in C if you're in something like rust it will be easier but it's still gonna be kind of gross and because you have to do a few shifts and stuff it's very slightly slower than integer math it's not so bad but it's a thing and you know the normal use of it honestly is on embedded chips that are designed for signal processing sometimes use fixed point because they can save money over building full floating point units while still getting a system that can work for doing reasonable signal processing things. TI makes systems like this. The system I worked with back in the late 80s and it's still around is a chip called the Motorola 56000. The 56K is an amazingly wacky chip. It has 24-bit registers, which can, you can combine to get 48-bit registers. It has 24-bit program and data words as well. And it has a 56-bit accumulator that has... so, And all of this is fixed point, is where I was going with this. So <coughs> normal numbers are 24-bit you know 23 bits plus a sign bit <coughs> or maybe they're 24 bits i don't even remember anymore um the accumulator has you know 8.48 uh, essentially and so by doing that they made the processor insanely cheap it was insanely cheap back then it's still insanely cheap today maybe more insanely cheap today while still being able to do quite a bit of decent audio signal processing. You look at this part and it's pretty clear that not only is this a DSP chip, it's an audio DSP chip. And that's why this 24-bit thing is so pervasive everywhere. It's, it's an amazingly weird chip, but it's a good example of where you'd use fixed point. And like I've said before in this course, I would strongly suggest you just use 64-bit floating point as much as possible. It just saves a lot of bugs. It may slow you down a tiny bit, but for the systems you're programming, probably not very much, and mostly you don't care. You'd rather spend your time chasing other things than read precision and overflow bugs, which mostly the floating point format will get you away from. The last thing I want to talk about is sort of, okay, fine. Now we know how we're going to represent numbers in our filters. What, how do we do this thing? How do we scale? So that, remember, the filtering idea, which we mentioned quite a while back is the idea that I want to take certain frequencies and emphasize them, increase their level. I want to take other frequencies and get rid of them to, you know, or scale them down to get make them less present or not in the sample. And there's sort of an obvious way to do that, which is to take your sample, 
convert it from the time, you know, take your signal, convert it from the time domain to the frequency domain. And once you have frequencies, you just literally multiply by scale factors to scale the, the bins in the DF in the frequency domain up that you want, scale down the ones you don't want. And then you do an inverse, transform back to the time domain and off you go. Now that's, like I say, the sort of naive way for some value of naive to get filtering. It's not the way most filtering applications work these days for reasons. Uh, for one thing, this means we do a DFT, we do an inverse DFT, and we do those at every sample position because as the signal changes, we want to track changes in the signal. This is, you know, and again, we have the problem that we have to think carefully about how big to make the DFT. If we make it too big, we don't get very good locality and time, and also it gets very expensive. If we make it too small, we don't get very good frequency resolution and things get terrible. We could try to slide more than one, overlap the signals a little bit, but now you're gonna lose some information from your signal from that, and that's a little awkward. The other problem is that the DFT has ripple. If you look at the bin centers, you know, if you take a signal that's white noise, you know, that's some signal that contains all frequencies roughly equally, frequencies between the bin center, you know, at the bin center are going to be higher than frequencies sort of halfway between two bins. So if you look at how the signal, how the response of the DFT varies, you're going to see a ripply shape. And that's because the two bins, you know, overlap, but they don't quite overlap enough to get the right thing to be what it, you think it should be. And so that's a problem. And it's especially a problem since, you know, 128 point FFT, which these days is kind of a small FFT on a 24 kilohertz sample. Well, the FFT has to divide the space evenly. So I'll get evenly spaced bins roughly 200 Hertz wide. And that means that you know, sort of if I'm going to try to design a low pass filter, let's say with a sharp cutoff, well then sort of if I look at the pass band of that filter, it's probably gonna take two bins to get down. I can't just whomp it in one bin. And so my pass band is gonna be something like a 400 Hertz pass band. Well, that's a lot, really. And I might wanna have a sharper thing than that. And so for all those reasons, you know, but especially computational costs, FFT scale inverse FFT is not the normal filtering process. And what I want to talk about next time is for real digital audio filters and sort of the standard technologies that are used to do that. So I hope that was helpful. I will talk to you again soon. Thank you very much for listening.